first off, thanks for joining me today, Anthony Hargrove. I appreciate it. Uh, man, a lot of people would like to know where are you at right now in life? I know you're coaching at Limestone. Uh, what's what's the transition been like? And just let people know what you're doing right now. Man, well, first and foremost, man, John, thank you for having me, man. Uh, this is an honor and opportunity uh, to be able to reconnect with my Southwest Florida family. You know, uh, been away for it feels like for an eternity. Um, but man, currently I'm I, you know, I live in Southern Illinois. I just finished coaching uh, seven seasons at Christopher High School with the Bearcats, um, and so transitions. I'm now transitioning to college football. Uh, that started in April. Um, the funny thing was Mike Fury had put his wife had posted that he got a coaching job at Limestone, and I was in the middle of a training session. The wife had texted me like, "Hey, Mike's at Limestone." Maybe some of your players could go there. You know, that'd be a great connection. And then next thing you know, it offers me an opportunity to join forces with him up there as the line coach. Um, and so we jumped on the, I jumped on the opportunity. And obviously, there's a obviously you mentioned Coach Fury and yourself, and I believe Jericho Cotri is that limestone as well. Oh my, yep, Jericho Cotri. So if you just really run down, I mean, it's a really uh, elite staff um, so far. What it looks on paper, like I said, Mike Fury, our head coach, who I was teammates with with the St. Louis Rams. Uh, probably the only player to ever play offense, defense, and special teams in the National Football League you know, at a high level. I think he led the league one year in interceptions and the next year in receptions. And so, and not to mention, he probably was a 50-tackle guy on special teams. Uh, our wide receiver coach is Jericho Cotri, you know, uh, one of the first-round draft pick, 2004 draft, the New York Jets. Uh, played 12 years, um, high-level football uh, receiver with the Jets and uh, Panthers. I think he spent his last years working with the Panthers uh, in some kind of player engagement, player personnel role, I believe. Don't quote me exactly on that. Um, offensive coordinator just came from Texas, Jay Costner, uh, um, who I've just met. I met in, his, in the spring. Lane Lane Noss is one of Coach Fury's first recruits at Limestone. This is Coach Fury's second tenure there. Um, and line, he recruited Jay Costner. Uh, yeah, no, Lane Noss, our tight end coach. And an offensive line coach is Nate Gardner, who played seven years in the National Football League. Uh, him and I played against each other when he was with the Miami Dolphins. Uh, him and Justin Smiley were on the same side. And so I actually rag on him a lot and be like, hey, man, remember when we came back and beat you guys when you had us down 21 in Miami? So he acts like uh, he can't remember that. I'm like, all right. But you switch over to defense, and our, our defensive coordinator is Joe Stab, who just came back, who just uh, left Michigan. Uh, he was a defensive analytics guy there, worked really close with the D-line. Um, and so our DB coach is Riley Swanson, also special teams coordinator. Him and I were teammates in Buffalo uh, in 2006. Riley played uh, had three or four seasons in the National Football League, had a, uh, a five-year run between the CFL and the AFL. Uh, but he's been coaching college football for the last seven years. Um, then you have myself, you know, D-line, uh, played National Football League, for eight eight years, um, and so when you put that all on paper, you're like, man, that's a that's a pretty loaded staff. And then we just uh, linebacker coaches Hunter Maynard, who just joined us this summer. He just graduated. Uh, can't remember his college, but um, it's a really fun, exciting, and youthful staff, man. And what is that like? Obviously, you played football. You said eight years in the NFL. And you're, you've been on coaching staffs at the high school level, and now you're here at Limestone. What is what has it been like so far early on with so much talent at the coaching level in terms of having experience in the NFL and bringing that to the table at college? What's it like being on a staff full of, full of experience like that? Well, uh, you know, I, I really wasn't sure what to expect going in. You know, being at the high school level, um, you know, it, it, the operation is a little bit different. But – the first impact was like, it's like being back in the locker room. You know, uh, there's a sense of familiarity uh, among all of us. Um, we're, we're able to communicate. Uh, we're able to reach goals. Like we're all, being that we all have football backgrounds, we all understand how to get, how to, how to achieve goals and get jobs done. And so if something needs to get done, nobody necessarily has to speak up. We just go get it done. Um, we operate because, you know, seeing how the NFL operated, you understand what good successful programs look like or organizations, you understand what bad organizations look like. And so I think having collective minds like that, we understand what good organizations look like and that's what we want to mimic, you know? And so having that many years of National Football League on staff, you know, we're, we, we've seen a lot. We've seen a lot of front offices. We've seen a lot of coaches. So it's a vault of information to pull from for what you want to be like. 
And is coaching something you've always wanted to do? Is that the transition you always wanted to make post-career? Or was it something that just kind of an opportunity came knocking? Or is that something you've always wanted? Man, so, no, it was like I woke up. Uh, so let me see. How, so in 2000, after we won the Super Bowl, um, and I came back home, I think in 2010, and I wanted to do something at home. But I really didn't know what. And uh, so I met a guy by the name of Wayne Guile, and he was coaching the Florida Veterans at the time. And so semi-pro football team there in Charlotte County. Uh, a bunch of my old buddies and high school teammates were on this team, guys that played ball, you know, guys that you grew up with. So it was, it was an immediate way to reconnect with my, with my buddies, with my classmates, with my friends, with family members that I haven't seen in so long, especially since I was transitioning in life. Um, and so we took on the opportunity to form Team Hargrove, which was a, a little management company, and we treated the, we treated the Florida veterans as an NFL club. You know, uh, I became a player, like a general manager, head coach. Um, and so we really planned all the travel practices, structures, and really just kind of, like I said, mimic NFL football and NFL stock, uh, NFL organizations. Um, and I fell in love with it after the first year. We went undefeated. Um, but what I really enjoyed was the relationships that I got to have with my friends. Um, you know, we were able to, they saw me as a coach. And so we communicated differently. Um, some of the guys revealed to me like how it changed their lives. And I knew that was the impact that I wanted to continue to have. Um, and so once I left South, I was there for two years coaching football, semi-pro football. Uh, then I had an opportunity to come up here in Southern Illinois. And I knew exactly I wanted to get back at I wanted to get right back into it. But I didn't know anybody here. And so uh, uh, my wife, she was working at uh, this pharmacy center in Marion, and they asked me to come speak. Uh, Jason Dunning, who was, who was, who was just, who's, who's still the defense coordinator, asked me to come to a practice. Man, I never left. You know, uh, I started coaching football. I got into the uh, school system as education tech. Uh, I worked with at-risk kids, um, which I which I I didn't realize that I would, but I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, you know. Um, I learned how to, I learned, I worked with autistic kids, which was a real passion of mine, um, but just really uh, working with people, especially young people, and trying to give them the tools to help change their lives or navigate their lives, uh, you know, whatever. And, and man, it's, it's been a passion. And so uh, I've been trying to merge all those worlds, coaching, training, uh, being kind of, uh, kind of like an education tech, uh, you know, the behavior model is something I really use a lot. Uh, and try to help, you know, young young people grow and even adults. And things that I've read about you in terms of wanting to enact change in the world and kind of impact young people. What is what is so gratifying for you to help young people and kind of uh, whether it's through athletics or through an education system, as you mentioned, what what about that is so something that's inspired you, driven you to make that plan in your life? Kyle Rebel, the fifth grade, uh, he came to. My fifth, he came to my classroom, Mr. Rebel's class at Deep Creek Elementary School, and he brought his Orange Bowl jerseys. And I had, I remember wearing my powder blue Port Charlotte banded jersey. And I don't know if you remember, it was like knitted. And I, they might have sprayed our spray painted our numbers on, you know, with a stencil. But he, he had his, he had on, you know, it was heavy Nike jersey, sewed on numbers. His name was on the back, and he had that big old Orange Bowl sticker. And I was like, man, I want one of those. And that motivated me, uh, that changed, like that, what he did that day changed my life. And it was so impactful. And it was something like I always tell people, like that moment, like changed everything for me. And I was willing to do whatever I had to do to get that jersey, you know, that, 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 that fine, that stitch number, last name on the back. Um, and so I, I know how powerful it was to me. And so that's what I want to echo. I, I want to continue to be what Ty Reba was to me, is to me, you know, um, because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real gratifying feeling when you see somebody who, who doesn't believe that they can do something and then they do do it and then their life has changed behind it, you know. And so um, being, being, you know, being retired from National Football League, being a Super Bowl champion, it gives me the platform for that. And so I'm really trying to, uh, to make, make it happen. And what went into to the retirement for you? What went into making that decision, knowing it was time to hang it up and start the next chapter? What was was it? I'm obviously it probably wasn't easy, but uh, what was that game, like? man. <laughs> they kicked me out. I so got look you. Here, so we're done with you. 
I said, you got to go. Um, you know, but man, all that, man, I loved it. You know, when, when Bounty Gate was happening, I knew it, the end was there. You know, uh, it was going to be hard to bounce back. You know, I'd had my first knee operation. Um, and so it was like, man, the body can only do so much. You know, uh, it's time to transition. And so I didn't want to be one of those guys, you know, sitting there trying to hang on, looking terrible out there, getting beat, the, getting a mess beat out of them. So I just, you know, tipped my hat, rode off into the sunset. And what was it like? And you don't have to go into great detail if you don't want to. What was it like going through the Bounty Gate situation and having that be a big part of your career in terms of obviously people mention your name and maybe that's what they think of? What is what is kind of that lasting impact for you? Man, you know what? Uh, and this is and that's, I mean, thank you for asking that question. But, man, I had such a mindset of understanding what was taking place. Right? Like I said, unlike a lot of people in Bounty Gate, I was in it from the beginning, from the initial interviews to the final suspensions. You know, um, I, I knew I saw the whole show. Um, and so was I painted as a villain? Yes. But you also, you know, they, they labeled me as one of the baddest guys in the National Football League. And so if I struck that much fear in people's heart, I wear it with a badge and honor. Yeah, I'm a defensive player. I'm a defensive lineman. My job was to get after quarterbacks, get after running backs. And you know what? If I'm the baddest guy in National Football League history, hey, it's a badge and honor, you know. Um, but going through the process, you know, it, it's something that I really wanted. I didn't want it to break me, but I really took a, a mindset of what what can I learn here? What is What is actually happening? And the things that I learned going through it, persistence, fighting, and really learning – how the system operates was, was was super rewarding, you know, and those are things that I try to I try to tell people, even when they're going through something with their lives or a business or a corporation, you know, and just, hey, what can you see here? Like what's really taking place? And is there a way to flip it and make it work best for you? And, you know, people may may look back on your career and, you know, maybe want to associate you with batting gate and things like that. But you also achieved a great thing that a lot of people that play football want to achieve, and that's winning a Super Bowl. So, I mean, you have – yeah, exactly. So, you have nothing nothing to to worry about, my friend. You you're, you achieved the success that you wanted to achieve. And what was that like, obviously, reaching the pinnacle in football, reaching the Super Bowl, playing with a Hall of Fame caliber quarterback, future Hall of Famer for sure, and then a defense that was feared by many. What was it like achieving great success and getting that ring? You get chills thinking about it, man. I mean – uh, we had a chance to go back a couple of years ago for our 10-year reunion and seeing everybody. It was amazing. You talk about, I mean, what is it, 44 guys on the roster, 53 um, that they keep throughout the season. But everybody was like-minded. You know, we, we weren't the best team, you know what I'm saying, on paper. But, boy, you had to fight every single one of us, you know, for, for the whole game. Um, we enjoyed each other. And that's not, that's, not, that's not common among teams. You know, you have guys bicker, fight. We weren't like that. We had one goal. We all wanted to win. And how could we learn from each other? You know, we would have a lot of brother talks in the steam rooms and in the saunas and just talking and just being real with each other. And then when we got out to the field and play, it was like we were one heart and one mind. And as long as as long as I looked to the left, I looked to the right. Though each one of those guys had had my back and I had their back. Um, but it's it's a it's rare. It's rare though because we you know we live in a world. You know, everybody, it's a very doggy doggy world. You know, everybody's looking out for their best interest. And it's hard to find one, even two collective minds that are all working toward the same goal. So when you've got 60, the whole building, 100 people, whatever it is in the organization, all working toward the same goal, you know, paddling the same way, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's remarkable. And once again, like I said, it's something that you want to mimic uh, because you understand how, how to achieve success and not just individual success but team success and then turning the page back to more locally in terms of port charlotte high school and coming to this area even before then you were in brooklyn correct is that originally yes, sir. okay and i'm and obviously i don't want to bring this up but you went through a lot of tragedy obviously as a child yep. in terms of was it your your mother's home burned down your apartment burned down yeah our apartment burned down yep yep our apartment burned down you know my my, my mom died when i was nine years old uh, and my, my father passed away a lot later in our life. Um, and man, I tell you what, and it's crazy. The older you get, more and more things are revealed to you about your life. And so even the things that I thought about my life at that point are, are different now because you actually find the truth. Um, we, uh, we had a chance to re-engage with our social worker just in 2012 at a New York Jets game. 
And we were able to go back and look at our records and, and find out exactly what happened to our, to our parents, what our lives really were like as young people, you know, but, you know, I was from Brooklyn, New York. Um, and, you know, the, uh, we called it the PJs, but man, you know what I'm saying? I, I loved it. Everything about me as a kid was, 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 that was me. I was the city. I was a city boy. Um, and so we, we, we left New York at the age of nine after my mom passed away. Um, but something like that, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to go through, but when you make it, there's so many other people that have similar situations. And when you're able to help them and you're able to talk to them and like use the same words and feelings that they're going to, that they're going through, it helps pull them out of that darkness, you know, and, and hopefully they can get on with their lives quicker. Um, but then, you know, so we got adopted, uh, in uh, 2000, no, uh, 1993, uh, we were down in Southwest Florida playing for the Port Charlotte Bandits. Um, and so football, that's when football became my outlet, was down in Southwest Florida. Coach Les, Rich Saltino was our offensive and defensive coaches. Um, Coach Dan Murphy said I was going to I was gonna go to the National Football League as a D lineman. We were like, no, 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 I'm going to be a, a quarterback or something. Um, but it was there in Port Charlotte where I found football. You know, or f- football found me, you know, uh, went to Deep Creek Elementary. Like I said, so I met Ty Rebo in fifth grade. And, you know, our junior P, our junior Pee Wee season mimicked the same season of the Florida State Seminoles that year. And so uh, it just seemed to like, for me, football was the way that I was going to go, always. And at Port Charlotte, obviously, you didn't start your career on the defensive line. You were a quarterback and yeah. free safety, I believe, right? Yes, sir. So Baby when you Cole Pepper. What's that? They used to call me Baby Cole Pepper. Okay. He was at UCF, and he was the first big, like the big quarterback, other than Jared Lorenzo. Um, but yeah, so these because I was about two twenty in high school, and so I used to go to state. Uh, like we play a stereo, we play lately. I come in, like, oh, it's, it's Baby Cole Pepper, it's Baby Cole Pepper. So. Yeah, I grew up. I'm I'm a Kentucky boy, so I grew up with a lot of Jared Lorenzo uh, oh, bless stories. You, Yes, sir. Yeah. But uh, what what is it like looking back now, knowing you played quarterback and safety, and then you made the transition in college to more of an edge rusher, correct? And then, yes, sir, yeah. and then with the Saints, you, Greg Williams put you more interior defensive line. What has it been like making that transition to different stages? I mean, obviously you have the athleticism to play all those positions at varying levels. But when you look back on it now, being like I played here, I played there, knowing you have like a well rounded knowledge of the game, what does that do for you? Man, right now it's like holy crap. I mean, how did how, how did you do it? You know, because I mean, really, I mean, I, so I played mostly offense most of my young football career. So when they switched me to defense and put, especially put me in the trenches, that's a different ball game. That's that's grown man football. And so I really kind of bluffed my way through defense for like four or five years, just from an offense, just because I knew offense. And so I'd read the offense, and then I just I'd play it that way. And then it really wasn't until I was like. Uh, my second year in St. Louis, where it all really clicked for me. But man, it was tough. I mean, you know, you know, uh, I've always been a leader, you know, a very vocal person who speaks, you know, out on the football field. And so transitioning from a vocal leader to just kind of you get told what to do, that was a really difficult transition, you know, but I'm not a quitter. You know what I mean? So I always wanted to make it work. Um, you know, they tried to put me inside when I was with the St. Louis Rams and I got my butt pounded. I, I wasn't ready for that kind of physicality. Yet, um, and so you know, uh, I did the outside. You know, uh, let's see, I did the out. I played uh, that was during the freak time. Javon, you know, Javon Curse. So you had the six foot four, two hundred seventy five pound guys that could run, jump, do everything you wanted to. Um, but then things started transitioning. They were looking for more of that hybrid player because everybody, you know, that that tweener. Um, and I remember I just got out of rehab. An old buddy of mine's Brian Young had just got injured in New Orleans and he was a three technique. And at this time I was coming out for treatment on the plus side of 300, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> 305. Um, and they wanted me to play three technique. So I was like, cool. Like that will be perfect. I'm got some what size on me. Um, and then made the adjustment, but you know what I'm saying? Playing inside, that's a different animal. Like that's grown man football. And so um, I use my athleticism, you know, to beat a lot of blocks. And then once I learned the defense and the schemes and then really learned how to zero strike, oh, it was on and popping. It was on and popping. Um, and that was one of the negative effects of Bounty Gate was just when I was like really figuring out that I was never going to be blocked again, you know, they kicked me out. 
you know, I spent, you know, and I got buddies that contest to this. I spent my off season in Green Bay and I never lost a pass rush. I mean, I used to do like backflips and stuff, just, you know, just, just for the heck of it in pass rushes. Um, and so, but if you're, you're a young football player, you're listening to this, don't be, don't be swayed by the position change. Learn everything you can. And then when you really learn this game, you make it your own. You're going to have so much fun playing it. And that's what it was like towards the end. I was just like, I was like a kid in a candy store, you know? Um, and so I'm glad I didn't quit, you know, going through all the different positions and learning it. And I made it the best. And when it was my own, man, it was, it was unreal. I'm telling you, it was unreal. And you brought it up there at your, your stint in rehab. What has it been like for you transform, transforming your life and getting to a point now where that's obviously in the past and obviously maybe you're still working on it, but the addiction holds a lot of great power over a lot of people. But for that, for you to overcome that in your life and be where you are now, what's kind of your message in terms of your journey there? Man, so, you know, I, I remember going through treatment, you know what I'm saying, doing NAAA programs and the meetings, and I loved it. You know, it was a great way for me to start sobriety and get my life going. But uh, just something that really stru I, I struggled with was just the grumpiness of people sometimes. You know what I mean? And I was like, if I'm going to be sober and I'm going to live this lifestyle, I at least want to be happy. You know what I mean? And so it was like, you know what? I need to learn to create this reality for myself. You know, and I'm a believer, you know what I'm saying? And so I believe in God. You know, he was he was the name I called on when I was when I was down and out. And he's a guy who got me this ring, you know what I mean? And who's empowered me to do everything that I do now. And so it was like, all right, Lord, like, really, what do you want me to focus on? Like, really, what do you want me to do? Because it's, it's, a, it's a substance and we make our choice whether we want to pick it up or put it down. You know, it, it's a choice whether we want to continue to use it or not. You know what I mean? And for me, I made a choice. That, that's not where I wanted my life. You know, um, I want to be a productive citizen. When I was in um, Charleston, South Carolina for my last stint, I had a chance to go visit the Fort Wagner. And um, I don't know if you ever seen the movie Glory. Yes. Yeah. The 56 Massachusetts. And so there there was a picture of the 56 Massachusetts in, at Fort Wagner in, in the museum. And I remember looking at this picture and it just, it just like my heart, like I started wanting to cry, but there was a guy in the picture and he had his hat, you know what I'm saying? Tilted like this. And it, and it, and it resonated with me. I was like, man, like there's always one of us in the group. There's always one guy that has to have it. He wants to be different. But then around him, they were all surrounded by men who were paying the ultimate, ultimate price, right? They're, they were going to give their lives for me to live a, a, a life that they could only imagine. They, they were only going to dream. And there I was pissing it away. You know what I mean? I was, I was pissing it away. And so it was like, you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore. You know, I'm going to fight. I'm going to, I'm going to fight the fight and I'm going to do right. I'm going to make the right choices, but I'm also, I'm not going to condone myself every two seconds. You know, uh, TD Jakes talks about uh, to, to, if you really want to reposition yourself, it's self-talk. Right. And so it's having those positive conversations daily. You know, it, it's called self-confidence for a reason. You know what I mean? And so and I'm not saying be cocky, but you have to believe in yourself that you can do better. Are we perfect? No, I'm a perfectly imperfect person, but I get the chance every day to get up and try to make something right. And that's something I learned in treatment was try to make do something right every day, but then just be a good human being. You know, um, I, I've I found my niche in life, you know, uh, it's, it's helping people. It's helping young folks. It's my, you know, my platform's coaching football. Um, and so here, here in recovery, man, that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm not focused on going out to the clubs and the bars. You know, I'm raising my children. Um, you know, I'm coaching kids, man. And, uh, and I'm trying to be the, you know, the best productive citizen that those men in Fort Wagner wanted me to be, you know, not out here pissing away what God's given me. And, and when you do a retrospect on your career and your life, whether it's being a star at Port Charlotte High School, having success at Georgia Tech, having a, a great NFL career, eight years, going through the bounty gate, whatever it may have been, overcoming what you've overcame in your life, and now coaching young athletes and being a father and a husband. When you have people retrospect at your career, what do you want the takeaway to be of who Anthony Hargrove is? Perseverance. Perseverance. Man, that ain't never quit. They never said no. You know, I mean, hopefully one day I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write my book. I'm going to do a movie. You know what I'm saying? But you can get through it, man. And I, I try to tell people this all the time. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. 
And so I just feel like the more things that I continue to overcome and the more obstacles that I can achieve, you know what I'm saying, and mountains I can climb, there's somebody watching. There's a young man out there that maybe I can, or young girl, anybody that might look at that and be like, okay, he did it, I can do it. You know what I mean? So, man, perseverance, man. You think of Anthony Harbour, think of perseverance. And you mentioned book and movie. Is that something you're really seriously wanting to do? Write a book? Hey, or- at this at this point, what think about it, bro. I got the I got the young part of my life, you know, the craziness, the burning fires, you know, losing my parents, you know, adoption, finding football, becoming a, a collegiate athlete, you know, getting drafted, going to rehab, coming back, winning National Football League. You know, now I'm coaching and I'm only 39. I'm only 39. <laughs> okay, then then the next important question would be if you if it does go to the big screens, who would you want to play you? Or would you want to play yourself? Curtis Jackson. Okay. Curtis I can see Jackson. it. I can see it. Yeah. Curtis, I can man, see it. Only reason. So in in college, that was like my little, that was my off the field persona. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah, Curtis Jackson. And I got to get a role with Denzel's got to be in there somewhere. Gotcha. And any kind of working titles or anything you're, you're thinking about or. Man, as we sit here, man, I'm thinking perseverance. Yeah. That'd be nice. It would really encapsulate the whole journey for sure. Yeah, I'm bad. I mean, that's it. But we'll have, to, we'll have to call 50 Cent up and see if he, he wants to make something happen. But uh, yeah, definitely. Then, hey, you, we have to tag him when this goes. We have to make sure we tag. Hey, 50, you have to look in at certain sort of parts. <laughs> there we go. I will for sure. For yeah, sure. We need to write this. this needs to get written. And then uh, a couple, maybe a fun question here for you before we before we go. Yeah. When you in in the NFL, every game day. The matchups in your career, having won the Super Bowl, who was your favorite team to go up against, or maybe your favorite offensive lineman to go up against? Kind of that one-one matchup. What was? What are some of the matchups you look back on in your career? Man, uh, Walter Jones, always great Hall of Famer. Got to play uh, multiple times throughout my career. Um, anytime I got to play a Florida team, going home, um, and then crushing Bill Parcells at, at every any chance I got. You know, um, I did. I mean, the tune that had me mad coming out as a rookie, so. I got to play them in Dallas, and I really wanted to crush crush any team Bill Parcells was coaching. Um, New York games were always special because it was like going home, um, playing against Justin Smiley. I was just talking about it. Uh, but him and I had long career battles against each other. Um, getting back against Brett Favre from when he got me as a rookie uh, had me like mad and frozen as a rookie on Monday night to taking him down for the NFC Championship. Um, Taking down Peyton Manning, beating Tom, beating Tom when he was just Tom, and then when he when he was Tom Brady, uh, you know what I mean. So, um, you know, it's it. I kind of go on for days, but those those games, those guys, those were always awesome. You know, um, chasing down. I love chasing down Lavernius Coles. You know, I remember when the Jets had all that speed: Santana Moss, Lavernius Coles, Jericho Cotri. So I used to love going to New York and running those guys down. Uh, Michael Vick, you know, trying to catch him, um, you know. Um, but really, when as when I got older, uh, one of the, my favorite players to play against was Steven Jackson. He's a buddy of mine. And so I remember when I would tackle him, I'd get on top. I mean, I always, like, wanted to get on the pile just so I could, like, say something to him in his ear. What's up, buddy? What you doing there? And he'd look up. Hard girl? I'm like, yeah, man, it's me. <laughs> you know. And having gone through Bounty Gate and, you know, having to serve your suspensions and things like that, when you look at the last few days, actually, with the NFL, how they've kind of divvied out suspensions and things like that, whether it be the Deshaun Watson uh, issue, going, and all the allegations with that, or uh, today even the, the Dolphins having to lose some draft picks because the the tampering stuff with the Bucs, that came down today. I don't know if you were aware of that. But, um, I didn't and, see that part. yeah, they lost, uh, I think it was a first and a third round pick from – where they reached out to Brady the last over the last three years, and actually I believe Sean Payton as well. They reached out to him last three years trying to get him to come over. But nonetheless, with the tampering issues, the suspensions like that happening, how do you think the NFL has evolved in terms of how they they deal with situations like that, or have they? Or are they are they still stuck in the past? Well, the thing that really stands out to me is that I see the suspensions, but I don't say without pay. You know what I mean? So if they're being suspended, they're still being paid. That's a huge one eighty. Uh, for my playing day, because remember, they used to post six game suspension without pay as well. You know, so if these guys are just getting a glorified vacation, uh, that sucks, you know, because a guy like me, you know, you, you took away my whole career. You know, you took away my free agency deal on some on BS or something they made up. So um, but, you know, I'm glad guys aren't losing 
all the, you know, losing large amounts of money for no reason. But I just wish the NFL would, I don't know, it's, it's the league, but. I got gotcha. you. I understand. And then to wrap up more positively, we'll leave all that stuff in the past. But in terms of um, how you want to be remembered in terms of what's next for you, you're obviously you're coaching now at Limestone is being a part of a coaching tree, something you want to keep on doing, move up levels. Uh, what's what's kind of in the cards for, for you in the next few years? After completing the summer camp up here, definitely, man. I definitely want to continue. I want to see what I want to see what happens at this college level. Like I said, it's it's a different pace of football. It's a different breeds of athletes, you know. And just really, just to see where I measure and where I stand up, stand up against it. Um, uh, as far as as a developer, this is my first time really working with uh, this many high level athletes, um, and so able to. I'm also a strength conditioning coach there at Limestone as well. Um, but so being able to develop athletes to withstand the physical abuse of college football. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for it. And so I want to see see where it leads to. Um, if it leads up to me getting up the next level of the NFL, hey, here I come, baby. There we go. And if, uh, obviously, people are going to get an update with this story about where you are. But if they want to keep updated with you, where can they follow you or kind of your social media? You can get those out there for us. Oh, yeah. Facebook, you can follow me all in, everything Ant Hargrove, Anthony Hargrove or Ant Hargrove, A-N-T-H-A-R-G-R-O-V-E, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I think that's all I use. I don't do anything else. I don't TikTok and I don't Snapchat. Snapchat. What is it called? Snapchat. <laughs> Snapchat. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> all right, man. I appreciate you sitting down with me today and taking the time and kind of looking back at your career and letting the folks know where you are now. Hey, man. Thank you, John. Hey, also, if there's any young people out there, you know, I'm always looking for some good talent. I'm looking you know, for some D linemen. Uh, you know, send me your huddle link and Hargo. You know, find me on Twitter. Hit the like button. Send me a message. Uh, we'll start the connection. So I'm always looking for great athletes.